use Spike as that character, right? But they could never get me in the room to tell us she was dumb because I would always burst the flames. And the smoking blanket only works for so many episodes. And so at that point I was like, I'm dead again. I'm, I'm dead. So I, I, I was kind of convinced that I was about to be axed the whole time. That, that sounds terrifying. Sounds <laughs> like IT. I, I, I'm also glad to know there was a rule for how many episodes a smoking blanket would work for. <laughs> What about you guys? Uh, who, who, has, who has some questions? Because, yes, I see them right here. Uh, I, I have two questions, actually. Well, you'll, we'll see how good the first one is before we, before we allow the second. Uh, what, uh, out of all the cast members, who do you think that you were closest to, like, as The question, and let's, let's make sure that everybody gets it. Out of all the cast members, who do you feel, who do you feel like, I like that you phrased it, who do you feel that you were closest to? <laughs> I have to say Tony Head, uh, the guy that played Giles. Uh, we were the older people in the cast. But, um, uh, seriously, he came up to me after the first episode, after episode two, uh, and uh, after school hard, and he comes up to me and he goes, we don't say it like that, you crap. You got the accent wrong. He, he sounds more like Spike in real life. And he said, I've got to hold my head up back home. So he, he would sit me down. He didn't really ask me. If he was a cast regular, I was a guest star. He'd sit me down, and we would go through this, this, my, my part of the script syllable by syllable and make sure that, that the accent was right. And we did that for about three months. And that's, frankly, that is why the accent was good. So I'm head. And yeah. Also, a real gentleman. And I, I have to say, I learned, I came from stage, so I had a, a lot of overacting in the beginning. And, um, at one point, Josh came up to me and he goes, can we have a little less Lawrence Olivier and a little more Tim Roth, please? <laughs> so, um, uh, I remember working with Tony and just thinking, man, would you do something? You don't do anything, man. And then I watched the episode, and I was like, oh, you were kicking my butt. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I learned how to stop acting with Tony Head as well. Um, but, you know, we both had kids. Uh, we both loved our, loved our families, and we kind of bonded. We're, we're a little generation older than the rest of the people. <laughs> no, that was okay. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. What is, is this a follow-up question or a totally second question? Oh, separately. I just want That's to weird. How much, <laughs> How much damage did that bleach do to your hair? Oh. How much damage did that bleach do to your hair? Um, the hair loved it. The scalp, not so much. Uh, I have naturally curly hair, and that's making me the dry scalp. And so that the bleach would get inside my scalp, and they would literally have to cut a lot of close-ups because pus, like one of the pustules, would come just drip down my face. Or if I did, I did a lot of my own stunts, and whenever I got slammed up against something, it would go. <laughs> No lie. So hopefully yeah. that makes a Blu-ray release. Go out playing on both every day. <laughs> Another question. Yes, right here. I found this letter that I wrote to the character Spike like 10 years ago. <laughs> you found the letter that she wrote to the character Spike 10 years ago. Oh, she found a letter. She's been holding this for a really long time. That's a weird question. <laughs> that is a shock. I'll keep that. <laughs> I didn't remember the letter, but I did see that it had your phone number on it. It was from 10 years ago. Okay, I'm willing to go with the question from a gentleman on this one. Don't, don't ruin this one. <laughs> Uh, you know, people, fans, you know, obviously, we, we lie to ourselves every day and say to ourselves there's going to be a movie one day. Do you ever hear a buzz and have an immortal vampire come back to a series after 10 years? Is it, is it, is it, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a good part of question one. Yeah. Will there be a movie? Two, kind of dickish question. Will there be a movie? First of all, we were known as Buffy the Weekend Slayer in Hollywood because we'd start at 4.30 in the morning 
and we'd work 12 to 20 hours, and we'd get out only when the sun came up Saturday morning. Uh, and Sarah, as you know, is in almost every scene, so they burned her to a crisp. And when it was over for her, it was over. And she decided, I'm, I'm going to move on, and I think she's held to that, and frankly, without her, we don't really have a show. Um, <laughs> Second question, uh, Josh came up to me when we were doing the ADR for the final episode of Angel, and he asked me if I'd ever like to do the character again in some other vehicle, and I said, dude, I will work for you wherever I am in the world. If you have one line for me as the nerd, as, I'll play a turtle for you, dude. <laughs> if you want me for Spike, you have seven years, because I don't want to have the character age. I, I, I don't want to have some stupid line like, oh, he's drinking pig's blood, he's aging slowly now. <laughs> One of the coolest the cool things about playing a vampire is that you are immortal, and if you give that up, there's something very much lost, and I'd rather just have, have that be cool and move on. And I remember him looking at me like, oh, because okay. I finally gave him a boundary. Before, it was like, anything you want, man, anything you want. I lit myself on fire for him. <laughs> Literally, we didn't have computers back then to do that. Right? <laughs> uh, and that was the first time, I didn't tell him no. It was, there was a caveat to yes. And that was enough that he was kind of like, mm -hmm, fine. <laughs> it's going to suck when they make a fucking movie eight years after this. <laughs> I'm saying, like, when they finally get around to making the, 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 the vehicle, and, every, all, and we revisit all you guys when you are like middle-aged, that would be really funny. Who will play Spike? I don't know if they're born yet, you know, because he's not going to age, so some dude in high school. Then. <laughs> Maybe someone in this room. We <laughs> the <laughs> I see a question over there. I love the character site because over the arc of the whole series, you get to do so much acting. Like in the beginning, you're just super badass comedian, and then in season four, you're like the sort of I don't get to do anything cool comedian. You know, I I can't And in the end, in season six and seven, you're like this. You know, you make all the girls cry. And you have all this drama, and you say the whole line of. I see clearly exactly who you are. She has dreams about you. <laughs> <laughs> so, my question to you after that long instruction is, of all that acting, all that varied acting you have to do, what was your favorite time? The beginning. The badass. I, I swear to God, when you play a hero, you have to be guilty about stuff. And you have to run around trying to save people and stuff. And you sweat all the time. And when you are when you're a villain, you just lurk. You wait for the hero to come by, you pop in the head, and you go home. And they can still give you the cool music behind what you do. I, I love villains. Uh, I'll take that any day. because. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. Um, Josh used to come up to me in the beginning of every season and say, I got nothing for you, man. I got no ideas. I don't know what to do with your character this season. And they're like, well, what else is new, dude? Um, but I think what happened was is they just plugged me in as needed. So I started out as the villain. Then I was the wacky neighbor. Uh, <laughs> then I was the outcast. Then I was the bad choice for a lover. And then I was guinea pig hero. And, and I think... Um, it was my job to kind of try to stitch all those together into one personality. Uh, but I think what that made for was like a really strange and unexpected ride. Yeah. And also a guest spot in her dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, in total honesty, please. Oh, Christ. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> one question. So, like, when you were, like, a teenager, maybe early 20s, did you actually sit at home and be like, God, one day I really want to be a sex symbol? <laughs> I can't, can't go into the fact. The question is, when you were a teenager, did you <laughs> sit in the room and say, wow, one day I want to be a sex symbol? There's a story behind that. <laughs> Right out of high school, uh, in high school, if you're a drama nerd like I was, you're a thespian. Right? Um, uh, there's an international thespian society, and they meet every other year at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. And uh, about 2,000 high school thespians come together and congratulate each other for being interested in the And <laughs> for every, uh, every two-year uh, conference, they cast uh, a play from the whole nation to perform for that conference. And the year that I was a senior was God's. So I grew up a little bit. 
So I, I grew out my hair. I had, I had like poo hair, right? So I grew it out for a year because I always wanted to do Jesus and Godspell because I also sing. And uh, I lost my job at Baskin Robbins. They said your hair's getting in the in the fudge. <laughs> Meanwhile, the women had, you know, it was the 80s, right? So they had hair out here. Uh, but anyway, I gave up the job there. But I got the role and we performed it. And um, I got a little taste of being famous. And like people would bust in to uh, the bathroom when we were going to the bathroom trying to see our junk. They would go, they, they would, they would, they would, yeah, they would, they, they, they would bust into our rooms through the windows to try to steal stuff off of our bed, you know, our personal effects. We had to be like carted from A to B to go to lunch and everything. And I remember in the middle of it going, this sucks. This is ridiculous, man. And I decided to go into theater. Because in theater, there's some respect. It's a little bit different, you know? And uh, I stayed in theater until I was in my early 30s, but then I had a son. And they say that a man's a brain uh, rewires when they see their first child, and his cognitive abilities sharpen somehow. And I experienced this with his voice from the ether saying, Go to Los Angeles, whore yourself out, make money. You are sleeping in the back of your theater company, and you're happy about it. But this little boy, he's not going to be happy about it. <laughs> And I, I went down there just out of desperation, and the federal government was uh, knocking on my door because I was cheating on my income tax returns and my, my unemployment checks and stuff. And then I met Josh Wheaton, and the rest is just cake. <laughs> so how was your son doing in the back of that theater company, did you? <laughs> no, man, he's a musician. He's got a rose piano. He's got a Les Paul guitar, and, he uses, and he's got a good digital drum kit, and he uses them all very well. Check out Mars Police on Facebook, y'all. Do it! <laughs> yes. Hi, Mars. Hey, Mars. Hey, so you're talking about music, and I happen to know that you are a musician. So, what is that the music career? Uh, long question there. You're talking about music. She knows that you're a musician. You can't hide that. So please, what's up with your music career? Yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you. I, uh, uh, I'm in a band called Ghost of the Robot, and we're dropping a new album on iTunes at the end of the month. Uh, it's called Murphy's Law. Uh, just remember Ghost when you go to iTunes, you'll probably find us. And it'll be charged $9.99, which is what it's worth. It's <laughs> like 300 bucks, which they were charging, like scalpers were charging for our other albums. Uh, so we decided to bypass the, the uh, DVD, the CDs right now, and just go digital so nobody gets ripped off. Uh, and I think it's our best album, so check it out. Oh, cool. Thank you for that plug, man. <laughs> yes. Uh, what do you miss the most about being on the show? What do you miss the most about being on the show? I miss the moments between the words action and the words cut. <laughs> because in, in those moments, everybody else had to shut the hell up and let me go. And I always felt like I was at the starting block waiting for that action. Just release me. And, uh, and at that point, all of the ingredients, the set, the props, the lines, and all that stuff, and they make me chef. Now I just chop up all this stuff and make a shot with the, with the crew. Uh, but it was actually, it was absolute heaven between those two words. I was just waiting for action. Man, you make me want to say the word action and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have time for a, a few more questions. I, I see a very eager hand right here. Yes. Yeah. She's wondering if she can hug you. We're going to save that for a little bit later. That's kind of creepy. Uh, if, you ask, if you ask the same question, it's going to get weird. You can hug that guy for sure. <laughs> I was just wondering what your experience on Supernatural was like and how you compared your experience on Buffy. The question is, how does your experience, what is your experience on Supernatural like and how does it compare to the experience on Buffy? Uh, I. I had a blast on Supernatural. I have to say, those guys, the two leads, are totally unaffected by the fame they've been given, which after seven years is very rare. It usually turns your head in one way or another, makes you weird in one way or another. Whether or not you get a big ego about it, it still freaks you out. Like, I was hiding from the world. I got paranoid about it, you know? Uh, uh, but they're just totally easy going and totally cool. The whole set is lovely and happy. And it's like, a, it's like a little piece of heaven. It was so easy, i got to say. And the best thing about the experience is finding out that Charisma Carpenter is a sweetheart. <laughs> I thought she was like Cordelia. I like drank Kool-Aid on that one. I, I, we never shot together. We were the same character, basically, so that there's no reason to have us talk. 
Or she was always running out the other end of the set as I, you know, I come in and she'd run away. We never had those folding chairs next to each other on stage, so I never found out that she's actually a, just a wonderful person. And so we got a chance to like sit backstage and talk about life and everything, and she's really cool. Yeah. yeah. That's a very awesome answer. What was the situation like that supernatural? Finally gave me a chance to find out that Chris McCarpenter was nice. <laughs> <laughs> My life. What you, what? I see somebody standing up and you were dressed like Eskimo Willow, so you definitely... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From the stage, you're Eskimo Willow. There's a lot of length. Do you have any weird talents? You know what you're watching? Yes. I can do I can do the sound of a water sprinkler. Excellent answer. And then you had a question as well? That's her question. So if, that, if, you, if you like answer, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Very weird. You all have something they would do well. Yeah. We all have the one thing. I still want to do my question. How was it doing once more with feelings? How was it doing once more with feelings? That's the bell for transition, as we call it. I have a whole speech about that. Um, I love doing that because um, we were terrified. That was the thing about Buffy is that, that basically a lot of my experience was being terrified because I realized that I had to show up and do whatever they told me to do whenever they told me to do it and you never knew what was going to be asked to have tweak. Like in a film, you can read a script and go, oh, I'm ready to do that. But, or in a TV show, you sign up and basically you remake the pilot the whole time. It's the same kind of journey every episode. But in Buffy, all bets were off. And that was at some point just terrifying. Um, uh, the way that I was introduced to the material was they didn't give a script to us. They gave a cassette tape. So I, there was a little cassette tape in a manila envelope, and I, and I was at lunch, and I opened the manila envelope, and I said, cassette tape, okay, put it in the cassette player in the, in the trailer, and on the tape was Joss and Kai, his wife, singing the songs <laughs> in the show uh, and playing the piano. So the problem was they can't sing, and they can't play the piano. <laughs> it sounded terrible. It was horrible. And I remember coming out into the lights with this weird look on my face, like, and everyone else is opening their trailer too, going, what is going on? And we all went to Joss and tried to talk him out of it. He wouldn't be talked out of it. And then a lot of people tried to get out of it on a personal level, especially afraid of music and all. Um, and, and, so, and, and so he forced us all to do it. And then he cut, he did a rough cut of the Xander Anya dance uh, song, because that's the first thing he, he filmed. And he wheeled a little TV out on the sound stage and he had us watch it just to prove that we weren't burning, you know, our careers. And we went from abject terror to real pride. Uh, but really, I, it's, it's my favorite episode because as a group, we had to all be really brave. We had to all really jump off that cliff and flap it. Uh, because it, otherwise you're going to slap, you know. And, and at some point people stopped complaining about it, stopped getting, getting, uh, trying to get out of it and hiring vocal coaches and dance coaches and everything and really, really trying their hardest to make it work. And it worked. And it was, yeah. So I'm really proud of this with the company. Have you, have you had the experience of being able to watch it with the crowd yet? I haven't. Oh, I love that. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're very close to that moment, but before we go there, I'd like to do one more thing. And uh, you, you, you and the and the wife taking pictures right now. You asked the very first question, yeah? Yeah. Will you come up here and help us transition? If you, if you didn't hurry, that would also be awesome. <laughs> I like that she just went for it, though. That's awesome. Some people will be like, no, I can't. I can't. You just made a little girl's dream come true. <laughs> now you made it creepy. <laughs> so, what, what is your name? Jeannie. Jeannie. Had you been to one of these uh, shows when we used to do them before at the other theater? I've been there a lot of 
It's a bit of a sing along, but not, but not a Buffy one. Okay, well, at, at a Buffy show, there's something that we like to do in between episodes every time, and we call it Buffy Oki. And it's, it's kind of like karaoke, except that you're not going to have to sing, you are going to have to act out a scene. And the scene that we always did, and James was awesome enough to say that we would do the same scene. <laughs> isn't actually in this scene. Um, Angel is. Uh, this is... This is the morning after scene. And what I would like for you to do is, is to portray Buffy while James plays the Angel. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have the scene with... Uh, the whole scene and audio and dialogue and everything up here on the screen. We're going to watch that once because you may not have seen it in a long time. James, you may not have seen it in a long time either. <laughs> then we're going to play it again with video, subtitles, and Jeff's soundtrack. You can read the subtitles, you can act out as much as you want, uh, except it would actually be illegal for you to take your shirt off inside this theater, so I need you to leave that on so <laughs> people will explode. <laughs> We're not having any exploding fans in the Alamo tonight. Do you think, do you think you're up for that? Oh. <laughs> Alright, well then, uh, let's just hang out. We'll hang out on the side of the stage, and if we can please just play that scene with, with the dialogue so that we can all remember how the Dulcet Choir of Pretty Little Birdies goes. <laughs> <laughs> 